Good morning, everyone. So um, this case uh, is a 62-year-old gentleman who has past medical history for hypertension and reflux who presented actually um, in 2017 um, to Dr. Tadros. Uh, he had been diagnosed with an aneurysm in 2012 of his uh, left iliac artery and um, had undergone embolization of a simultaneously found AVM in May of 2017. The surgeon at that time where he was treated at, on the outside told him that he didn't have a stent large enough to uh, fully repair his aneurysm, um, and the patient developed some shortness of breath and was uh, uh, subsequently referred to Dr. Tadros. The patient had a CTA and an MRA uh, two weeks prior to the initial um, uh, the index uh, embolization at MSH, and uh, the aneurysm looked larger, and therefore uh, intervention was planned. Um, prior to that, six months, he had been having bilateral numbness in his lower legs and pelvic uh, discomfort. So therefore, a multi-staged uh, uh, procedure was planned. Next slide. So this is his procedural history thus far. In 10-2017, he had IMA embolization, so multiple feeders from the IMA. In November of 2017, he had a left hypogastric segmental branch embolization with glue. Um, and another one in uh, January of 2018. Um, then he had bilateral subselective hypogastric embolizations in February, and then a selective, an, an additional selective IMA embolization in April. So this is with his initial workup. So you can see on the left-hand image, um, an arterial, large arterial feeders, multiple of them, and then the large draining vein on the right. Next slide. And the angiogram image all the way on the left is his initial angiogram from uh, the aorta. You can see multiple feeders from bilateral uh, hypogastrics. Um, the IMA feeders may not be as obvious on that picture, but um, present at that time. Um, the middle image um, was, the middle and the all the way right image are images from the just uh, preceding embolization about one month ago. And you can see there are still multiple residual feeders, um, one of which we're going to attack today. Next slide. So in summary, um, this is continuation of a staged transradial subselective glue embolization of bilateral or unilateral hypogastric arteries. If we could go to the first run, please, that would be great. Next, please. So obviously you saw in that there, there's a lot of glue filling the pelvis, but I think most notably here, what you see is there's a paucity of perfusion from the left internal iliac artery. And while it's still certainly enlarged, the uh, anterior division of the left hypo ha has really been debulked. And you're seeing a, a, a very, very small percentage of the perfusion or shunt from the inferior mesenteric artery and the rest from the right. Next run, please. So we actually uh, started this case by uh, trying to put a, uh, a, uh, a, a guide system all the way down into the right hypo. And the patient's actually somewhat tall, uh, which we uh, found out the hard way because this was our 125 catheter in the common iliac artery. And we, 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 we were really not able to visualize anything here. Uh, as you can see, our target was the right internal iliac artery. And there's a number of name branches off the uh, pelvis here. Next slide, please. Or sorry, next, next run, thank you. So here's just a magged up view. And you can see there's just a number of hypertrophied vessels. There, there's one that's coming down the midline. We felt that was likely the obturator. Next, next angiogram, please. And so we finally got into that. And so this was, we, again, we felt this was the obturator. And we're seeing a lot of what I'm going to call normal arterial branches feeding the uh, pelvis. At this point, our 155 microcatheter was actually hubbed. Uh, and so ne next run, please. Here's uh, another branch. And obviously, there's absolutely no shunting here whatsoever. Next run, please. Same branch, just farther, uh, a little bit more proximal. Again, no shunt that I think was worthwhile to treat that would do anything to improve this guy's symptoms. Next run, please. 
Same normal anatomy. Next run, please. Again, the obturator. And again, you're seeing just a lot of normal pelvic floor branches, which I thought was not worth the risk to try and sacrifice these. Next run, please. And again, that's just showing how that's a posterior branch and that's likely the obturator. Next run, please. Next run. And so we, we finally said we're going to just regroup. And you can see there's a lot of very enlarged anterior branches. Next run, please. And we were subsequently able to catheterize a branch, which we think is a, a safe spot to perform a transarterial embolization. Next run, please. I'm not even sure what to name this artery, but we feel that we're in a good location right now. It might even be the prostatic, to be honest with you, uh, to be able to do a uh, transarterial uh, embolization with NBCA uh, tissue adhesive. And so if we, could, if we could go live to fluoro. So I'm going to mag up a little bit more just so everybody can see. So everyone can now actually obviously see the microcatheter. And we're obviously prepping it with, with uh, water now. But we're going to watch it very, very closely to see how the, gr the glue traverses through the nidus and likely over to the venous side. And we're going to be very, very patient not to uh, remove the – there's the glue going in, as everybody can see – not to remove the microcatheter too quickly. And I'd, I'd probably put in a little bit more glue here, either either empty out the microcatheter, because I think we're getting actually very good penetration of the nidus here. And there's a little bit more coming out. We're getting a little bit of reflux. And I think that was actually a very good concentration to be able to uh, penetrate the nidus. And now we're getting a little bit of reflux. So I think we're just going to wait for about 30 seconds or so before we remove this microcatheter. So I think now it's a good time to remove the microcatheter. And again, we, as you can tell, we waited a really long time. We waited about two minutes. Yeah, a little bit more. And the microcatheter is just going to come right out now. Perfect. All right. And so, uh, as you can see, we have a good cast of that artery there with the, with the glue. So we've not only got the nidus, but we've got the inflow as well. And certainly it's not cured, but much better than it was before. And uh, unless anybody has any strong comments, I think, you know, Robbie and I are going to talk about whether they're going to do a second vessel or they're going to call it quits for the day. Uh, but I, I think it was a you know, really good teaching example of how to you know, try and use radial techniques to facilitate transarterial embolization in a deep pelvic uh, arterial venous malformation. And we actually got into another branch, which was perfusing basically, the, 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 basically another malformation Can I get another coil? here, and we actually embolized that as well. And this is actually our completion after embolizing that additional branch. So looks like we still have that big branch coming off the obturator, uh, but much better than initially with that first branch that we embolized. Rami, there was a question from the audience um, yeah. just about glue administration and kind of waiting with the microcatheter. Uh, when do you feel comfortable pulling the catheter? And if the glue has set, do you worry about, you know, uh, gluing your catheter in? Uh, so the answer is yes. Uh, you definitely worry about gluing your catheter in. So actually, we imaged – actually, didn't save that. So um, usually you kind of wait a couple minutes, make sure the glue is set. Um, it's nice to have a base catheter uh, to, to rely on, and then – when you basically put back tension and pull the microcatheter, um, usually if you have a base catheter to kind of pull it into, uh, a lot of times you're safe, but you can definitely get the catheter stuck um, and potentially pull the glue mass back, creating non-target embolization. So I, I think the, the safest thing to do in that scenario is to have a base catheter or a, uh, 
a guide, uh, something to basically uh, be able to pull back into. Yeah, I think that's a great point, having early on making sure that you have the parent catheter as far out as possible so that you can almost kind of shear off the uh, microcatheter from it if glue were to come back with the microcatheter. just gives yeah. you an extra level of safety. In this case, you don't really have that, um, but, you know, with more experience, you probably get more comfortable with uh, being further out from your parent catheter. Yep, I agree.